at this stage, we are lacking knowledge on the new virus. So of course, we have to compare back to viruses that we know about. Influenza is clearly at one end of the spectrum. Seasonal influenza is very transmissible. It comes back year on year. It's mutating all the time. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I would say we have SARS, where it wasn't very transmissible. Uh, it would appear to only uh, transmit after very severe symptoms uh, and was more easily controlled actually by public health measures and didn't require almost that we develop vaccines. Uh, every new virus that emerges is, is a virus in its own right. It will have a combination of features about it, which mean that those comparisons are useful, but we can't rely on them in the longer term. And really what's key now is to start studying the details of the new virus to sort of put it in its place somewhere between influenza and SARS as a human respiratory pathogen that's passing through the air between people. So this new virus is a coronavirus. So what does that mean? Uh, it's one of a family of viruses. In general, the structure of the virus is that it has an envelope, a membrane, in which are inserted various spikes. Those are how the virus is going to latch on to the cell. And the shape of those spikes is such that the virus itself looks like it's wearing a crown, and that's why it's called a coronavirus. Inside the envelope is the all-important genetic material and its RNA for this virus. Uh, and it's a huge piece of RNA. It's 30 kilobases long, which is much bigger than any of the other RNA viruses we know of. So that's quite interesting because uh, it comes with a few sort of difficulties. A virus having such a huge RNA genome has problems in replicating that because RNA dependent RNA polymerases, which are the enzymes which it's going to use to, to replicate its genome, are error prone. They make mistakes. And uh, that's why lots of viruses like influenza uh, sort of evolve very quickly because they accumulate these mistakes and then uh, fitter viruses can get selected. But the, if the coronavirus made so many mistakes on such a large genome, it would just kill itself because it would go to what we call error catastrophe. It would be so full of mistakes that nothing would work. And so it actually carries its own proofreading enzyme with it to correct the mistakes it makes. So it's a really unusual type of RNA virus. It's got many features of our friendly RNA viruses that we know about, but it's also got some really different things about it, which mean that it's, we, we can't just assume that everything that we know about RNA viruses applies to the coronavirus family. So we have known since the early 2000s, following the outbreak of SARS, one of the more famous coronaviruses out there, that there are many, many coronaviruses that exist in the wild in bats. And uh, these viruses uh, exist in bats. They don't appear to cause a huge amount of disease in the bats. Uh, but of course the bats are living in huge numbers in colonies, in caves, etc. And there are many different uh, strains of these bat coronaviruses that have now been identified. And what we know about coronaviruses is that they're very good at undergoing recombination. So if a single bat is co-infected with two different bat coronaviruses, then the genomes of those two viruses viruses can, can switch around and swap up. So you get a sort of chimera or, a, or a, a jigsaw of two different viruses in the bats so that are recombinant. And most likely this new virus is a recombinant of two bat, two or more bat viruses. Certainly um, there is homology between the sequence of this virus and other bat viruses which have been discovered. But it isn't at all clear whether or not it's come directly from bats into humans or whether or not there may have been an intermediate host. Again, looking back at SARS, it's very clear that the civet cat was an amplifying or intermediate host. Civet cats were being kept in live markets and humans were therefore having much more contact with those animals. Um, so it is possible that a wild bat virus has found its way into another animal which is being held in live markets and that has been the interface by which the virus has crossed into humans. But as yet it isn't completely clear what that animal might be. Each respiratory virus uh, transmits between people with a different efficiency. 
And there are many, many different factors that play into that. So from one side, it's the virus. So it's about how stable is the virus in the environment and in the air. Physically speaking, does it fall apart uh, when, you, when it's warmer? Um, does it sit in droplets uh, which are falling more rapidly onto the ground, etc.? Also, what receptor does the virus utilise to bind and enter cells when, it receive, when, it, when it's received by the recipient? So are those receptors abundantly expressed on the upper respiratory tract of the recipient, in which case we would expect very efficient nose-to-nose -nose transmission? Or are they only present in the deep lung, in which case the virus really has to be an aerosol to get down into the small airways and, and reach the receptors? So that plays into it as well. How does the virus fare with human mucus, which is an innate barrier which overlies many of the ciliated epithelium, which are the target? Can the virus find its way through the mucus, or is it rather rapidly expelled from the body? So all of those physical features of the virus when it first emerges from an animal and finds its way into humans are going to determine the early R0. But the R0, the number of people that one infected person infects, is also determined by all kinds of other things which are not really to do with the virus. So the host, all right, how susceptible is the host? Has the host ever seen uh, anything like this virus before which will modify how much shedding there is by one host in, in terms of passing virus on to another? How dense are the hosts that are susceptible here? Are they all living in very dense conditions or are they spread out? What age are the more susceptible hosts and the people who are involved in transmission? So all of those parameters about hosts will also feed into the overall transmission of the virus at any one stage. And both of those things, both the host side and the virus side, change as time goes by as does the environment as well. So maybe the virus is more transmissible on a hot day than a cold day or the other way around. That all changes as well as does human behavior with environmental changes. So we can expect the dynamics, if you like, of the virus to change as the epidemic proceeds, partly driven by host changes, perhaps also driven by some evolutionary changes in the virus. There's a lot we still don't know about how this disease might spread. You know, it's, it's early days, we're, we're learning every day new things about this virus. We assumed initially that it must be spreading via aerosol and you know, how is the aerosol generated if the people who are spreading it have really very few symptoms. They're often got a slight cough but they're not producing sputum, they don't have the rhinorrhea, they don't have the typical common cold, so how is it spreading? You know, we're at the moment rather suspicious that it might be spreading by hand contact and then hand eye or hand nose contamination which is why we're emphasizing hand washing as very, very important. So people who wash their hands five or more times a day are less likely to be infected with influenza, for example. We know that. So, you know, hand washing is good. Wearing masks, controversial. The Chinese are wearing masks a lot, but they are often quite um, keen on wearing masks anyway. We don't know that that's definitely beneficial there is an argument that it might even be harmful because then you're messing around with your mask, you're putting it in your pocket, you may be putting it down on the desk. You know, that may potentially um, spread infection. So we're not at the moment saying that it's mandatory to wear a mask in order to prevent transmission in the community, but obviously in hospital, you have to wear full protective equipment because you may be exposed to high risk spreading events. And in hospitals where in China where it's being used really religiously, then f relatively few of the hospital staff are being infected. In hospitals where they maybe don't have so much PPE equipment available, then a high proportion of staff, maybe 40% of staff in some hospitals, have already become infected with this virus, and the proportion of them may have severe illness or may die. Early data indicate that the new virus is actually binding to the cell surface protein known as ACE2, angio angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And interestingly, this is exactly the same receptor that SARS used. And also the same receptor that one of the four other human coronaviruses use. So that's tantalizing because on the one hand, we might think that 
receptor usage alone is determining how transmissible a virus is. SARS seemed to only be transmissible when people were very, very sick. But the other human coronavirus, which is known as NL63, Netherlands 63, is one of four human coronaviruses which cause 15% or so of the common colds we have every year and seems to be pretty transmissible from person to person without making people very sick. So from a virologist's point of view, this, this doesn't really add up because we normally think that the receptor a virus chooses determines its transmission and its pathogenicity. So there must be more going on. One idea could be that the other coronaviruses and possibly this new virus are using a second receptor, which we haven't yet identified. And we do know that some of the other coronaviruses do that, either to help them stick down very well onto the cells or even as an alternative entry route. So I think it's going to be important in the coming months to have a look at that and, and understand why these differences exist between these coronaviruses, which apparently use the same cell service molecule. I think it's important to emphasise that this doesn't present like a common cold in most cases. In other words, it doesn't cause sort of rhinorrhea, sneezing, sore eyes, you know, that sort of thing. It's presenting as a cough, as malaise, sometimes shortness of breath, but, you know, it's really presenting as a rather sort of uh, lower respiratory tract disease. So having an expectation that they have to have an upper respiratory syndrome or that they have to have fever that's only present in a proportion. You know, it's, it's presenting in a very non-specific way, mostly as a lower respiratory tract infection. So the symptoms in the early stage of the disease are very non-specific. I mean, there was the case described of the lady from um, Wuhan who went to Bavaria to visit a factory and she was there for two days. She apparently felt okay, but maybe it was a little bit you know, she thought it was jet lag or something like that. She apparently was taking some paracetamol or something while she was there, but didn't make anything of it and basically said she felt well. And it was only on the flight back to China that she started to really feel ill and through a fever. But in the time that she was in Germany, she managed to pass on the infection, which then was passed subsequently to some other people at the, at the factory. Um, and it's clear that you don't have to be very symptomatic to pass this on. The same sort of story with the person who came back from a meeting in Singapore, went to the uh, French ski chalet and managed to infect quite a number of the ski party, um, apparently while still able to go skiing and, and feeling okay. So, you know, you don't have to feel particularly ill in order to pass on the disease. And that makes it quite a hard disease to control in terms of prevention of transmission. So in terms of what we know about the pathogenesis of this, this disease, it's very early days. But I think, you know, we can, from what we know about other severe infections, we can, we can begin to speculate. And we think that what happens initially is that the virus must enter through the epithelium. Uh, we're assuming through the respiratory epithelium, but it's possible also that it might get in through the gastrointestinal tract. We know that many coronaviruses have dual um, uh, tropism, both for the respiratory and the gastrointestinal epithelium. And some of these cases, there is a bit of diarrhea. And maybe even in those without diarrhea, there may be secretion of virus via the stool. So we're assuming that there is a bit of interplay between the gastrointestinal and the respiratory tract. So the virus gets in, it starts to multiply in the absence of any sort of um, initial host defence because there doesn't seem to be any cross-reactivity between the known human coronaviruses to which we are all exposed as common cold agents um, and this novel coronavirus. So once it get in, gets in, it multiplies and probably that initial phase is mostly controlled by the innate immune response because there is no specific immunity in terms of B cells, T cells. So I'm speculating here, but what we saw in our very detailed analysis of um, pandemic H, H1N1 in 2009, 2010 via the Mosaic study, which was a national study, which I led on here from, from Imperial, we saw an initial phase when the response was more or less an antiviral response with interferon and so on. That then diminished after a few days and was replaced by a very powerful inflammatory response in those with more severe disease.
And that inflammation, <clears throat> as I say, was quite non-specific. It included a lot of different cytokines. It included cells migrating into the site of infection and releasing their, um, their mediators, the cytokines, the chemokines, and a, an outpouring of many, many mediators, including things like tumor necrosis factor, IL-6, um, IL-1, you know, you name it, it comes out into the secretions and into the blood. So that's the sort of cytokine storm, the immunological storm phase. And that was much more severe in those who went on to have, uh, to have bad disease and need ventilating. What I'm speculating is that the deterioration that we're seeing after the initial relatively mild phase, it reflects the cutting in of that innate, powerful immune response, which is pro-inflammatory and which maybe is appearing at a time when there's still virus there and there is a sort of immunological overreaction which causes the ARDS, the inflammation of the lungs that we see on chest X-ray and on CT scan. That probably reflects this immunological hyperreactivity, which is uh, contributing to the disease at that stage. In this particular case, there seem to be hints that the cardiovascular system is affected later in the disease in some of the patients with severe, um, severe disease, severe infections. We don't know why this is. We do know that the virus gets in via the same receptor as SARS, which is the ACE2 receptor. There may be other co-receptors, but this appears to be one of the main ones. And that, of course, angiotensin converting enzyme is involved in the control of blood pressure. The patients with severe disease sometimes are actually slightly hypertensive rather than hypotensive. Often patients with severe illness are hypotensive. Some of these have a slight rise in blood pressure. And we don't know whether there is some sort of inflammation process going on in the heart. It could be a myocarditis or even a, an end arteritis. We don't know. Um, and that could be related to the virus actually re reaching the heart tissue and might be involved in some of, some of the deaths. We know that patients who've been put on ECMO, so who are extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, um, in order to support them through the respiratory failure, sometimes they die regardless, and perhaps that could reflect myocardial um, um, if, um, infection with the virus. This is all speculation. We don't know yet, and we're really waiting for detailed studies where the virus is being sought in the, in the heart and in other tissues as well. So in terms of treatments, I think it's very important to emphasize the difference between somebody with mild illness, which we hope is going to be the majority, and those who may actually need more advanced treatment in hospital or in intensive care. The initial disease is, tends to be quite mild. And there, you know, self-isolation, paracetamol, ibuprofen, you know, sleeping it off, the usual sort of things that people do when they feel a bit under the weather is all you need. And there's no evidence that anything on top of that is going to be beneficial. So at the moment, there's no proven antiviral. Antibiotics are of no help at all. And so that's about it. In those that need hospitalization, the treatment is supportive care and avoiding things that do harm. I think most importantly, there were studies in the SARS outbreak where patients were given very high dose steroids in some hospitals, not given steroids at all in others, sometimes given a bit of steroids in a third. You know, there was a complete spectrum of opinion about whether steroids helped. I would say generally the experience from that outbreak was that steroids were not helpful and indeed were causing harm, particularly in the very, very high doses that were being used by some. So I would say avoid steroids unless there's a specific indication for steroids. Almost all the patients that have been reported have been put on antibiotics. That probably is not a good thing, but it's irresistible as a clinician when you're faced with somebody with mnemonic changes on the chest x-ray, a fever, a cough, you know, who is going to withhold the antibiotics? However, it's perfectly possible that the antibiotics are counterproductive. Um, so I would, I would suggest that the decision to use antibiotics should be caref taken carefully. Obviously, the symptomatic treatments with paracetamol, acetaminophen, to bring down the fever seems very reasonable, but in some common colds, there's a bit of evidence that 
using a lot of those sort of antipyretic drugs can actually mean that the virus load stays higher for longer. So you know, even that, maybe there isn't such a strong evidence base. Unfortunately, there are no antiviral drugs licensed specifically for the treatment of coronavirus infections at the moment. The, there are some likely candidates which can be tested quite quickly in clinical trials. For example, some of the drugs that we currently use against HIV target the protease enzymes of HIV. And because coronaviruses also express a number of proteases in their replication cycle, there is some thought that the protease inhibitors that were originally developed for HIV may be effective against some of the coronaviruses. And indeed, some early preclinical work with the MERS virus, which is another coronavirus that's emerged from animals into humans in, in the last decade, those trials or those preclinical trials do suggest that these HIV protease inhibitors might be worth trialling. So that's one set of drugs. There's other drugs that we would think of using against RNA viruses are the nucleoside analogues. So these are like small bases that get incorporated into the growing strand of the new RNA that's being synthesised by the virus. And when they get incorporated, they either terminate the chain or they make a mistake and you get mutation over and above the, the regulated rate that the virus can tolerate. Um, there is a new one of those which looks effective against coronaviruses. Interestingly, many of the nucleoside analogues that have been developed for other viruses don't work against the coronaviruses. And remember that that might be because the coronaviruses encode their own proofreading activity to stop themselves making mistakes. But some of the nucleoside analogues do appear to be effective enough against coronavirus replication that they, they might work. And again, in preclinical trials, uh, one particular drug, rem remdesivir, looks as if it could be working and therefore uh, probably a priority to go into clinical trials. Uh, so the current diagnostic tests which are being rolled out around the world now are all based on the very rapid release of the sequence of the first strains of this virus by our Chinese colleagues. So we need to com commend them for that very rapid sharing of knowledge which has been utterly vital for people all around the world to develop and test and validate the tests. What we use is a reverse transcriptase PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, it's a very standard uh, format for viral diagnosis in laboratories around the world and it relies of course on the, uh, the sort of very specific binding of primers to the target sequence of the virus. Um, one can have tests which are highly specific for the new coronavirus because its nucleotide sequence is different than all the other coronaviruses and those have now been standardised and validated by Public Health England, people working at Collindale very hard to get those tests rolled out and the tests are now rolled out um, to NHS colleagues around the country poised and ready to pick up cases if they, if they present. This new test that's been rolled out which is the RT-PCR uh, is useful and correct for diagnosing cases that present at A&E uh, so that we know who to isolate, who to treat. But as the epidemic rolls further forwards, we may need different sorts of tests and different diagnostic platforms that, that allow a higher throughput um, or a more rapid um, or mobile readout could be useful. So there are many, many people now trying to develop different assay formats which might be appropriate under different circumstances. Um, and I think that's totally right. I think you probably need lots of different approaches to, to bring to bear on this. You may need a test which is, uh, can be developed in the field uh, using some very easy visual uh, readout that doesn't require sort of automation or, or um, sort of laboratory machinery, if you like. So there are lots of different formats being tested. Another thing that we will need to do going forwards is to develop good serology. So we need to know how many people we've missed so far who may have been infected by the new virus but either not shown symptoms or uh, just stayed at home and recovered 
Uh, and that is really important for many, many reasons, but the most obvious one is, is understanding the epidemiology as we go forward. We need to understand how many people have actually been infected rather than just the ones we've seen. Uh, and serology is a way to do that. However, bearing in mind that we know that there are four other coronaviruses out there that circulate in humans, it will be very important that our serological tests are specific for the new virus and don't pick up on antibodies that have been generated by somebody having been infected with a different human coronavirus in previous years. So as we go forward and develop these new tests for both viral antigens and viral antibodies, then specificity is going to be key. When a virus emerges from animals into humans, um, it clearly is fit enough in the new human host to cause some disease and to spread. And that's where we currently stand with this new virus. But what we often expect as time goes by, particularly with an RNA virus, which we know can mutate fairly readily, is that the virus adapts to the new host. So that's certainly what we see with something like influenza. When the pandemic emerges, actually the virus spreads quite rapidly in the first place because we have a lot of people who are naive, don't have any pre-existing immunity. But gradually, the virus uh, ends up having to sort of evolve to become more transmissible in order to find a host who hasn't yet met it. And so we may expect, as this epidemic proceeds, some changes being selected for in the new virus which might make it more transmissible and we know roughly speaking where we might look for those changes so this spike protein which is the one that's sticking out from the surface of the virus and which is responsible for the attachment of the virus onto human cells we know that in the SARS epidemic as that epi epidemic rolled on we did see evolutionary changes accumulating in the spike protein which may have been because the virus was honing its ability to bind and enter human cells and those are the sorts of mutations that we might need to start looking for in the new virus as the, as the epidemic rolls on particularly because the spike protein of course is also the target for vaccines that we might develop and so if that is changing we need to be sure that it's not altering the ability of the vaccine to protect us.